and you're watching and listening to the Electronic Intifada live stream. I'm Nora Barrows Friedman. Coming up, we'll have an interview with physician Ben Thompson, and we'll get a full update from John Elmer on the latest military developments in Gaza. But first, Ali, please introduce our first guest. Thanks so much, Nora. Uh, it was so difficult to listen to a lot of that news, but thank you for that very thorough summary. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce Ilan Pape. He's a professor of history at the University of Exeter in the UK and director of the European Center for Palestine Studies. Many of you will know that Ilan gained renown as one of the uh, new historians, a group of Israeli scholars who in the 1980s shattered long-standing Zionist lies about the founding of Israel and corroborated what Palestinians had been saying all along about the ethnic cleansing and massacres that they survived um, during the Nakba in 1948. He's the author of many, many books, far too many to uh, mention here, but two of them are a, a History of Modern Palestine, One Land, Two Peoples, and The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. Ilan is also a regular contributor to the Electronic Intifada. He is, of course, a distinguished scholar, but he's also been a prominent, a prominent and longtime advocate and voice for the liberation of Palestine from Zionism. And I hope I can also say that uh, I consider Ilan to be a very dear friend as well. Welcome, Ilan. Hello, Ali, and, and everyone. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor to be in the live stream with the Electronic Intifada, and thank you for your kind uh, introduction. Thank you, Ilan. First, let me just ask you how you're doing. We're all now, it's more than five months of this genocide, almost six, and uh, I just want to ask you how you're doing. It's very difficult. Uh, I, I find it difficult to concentrate on my regular work. I find it difficult to sleep. Um, I'm fully aware of what goes on. It's heartbreaking. Uh, it's infuriate, infuriating. And all one can do is double or triple our efforts, first of all, to stop the genocide, but continue also the long strategic aim of liberating uh, Palestine. So uh, personally, of course, uh, all of us are preoccupied with this. We are not suffering as the people of Gaza do, uh, but I'm I'm definitely feel the pain. And um, this is for me, and I'm 70 years old this year, is the worst period uh, I experienced personally uh, in the history of uh, modern Palestine. Mm -hmm. I know that we all, all feel very similar. Um, Ilan, we're going to discuss a lot of the, the issues you raised, but first I, I want to remind you, I'm sure you haven't forgotten, that in 2006 you wrote for the Electronic Intifada, and I quote, a genocide is taking place in Gaza. You described this uh, later as an incremental genocide, but 18 years ago you wrote, these words, nothing apart from pressure in the form of sanctions, boycott, and divestment will stop the murdering of innocent civilians in the Gaza Strip. There is nothing we here in Israel can do against it. Brave pilots refuse to take part in the operations. Two journalists out of 150 do not cease to write about it, but this is it. In the name of the Holocaust memory, let us hope the world will not allow the genocide in Gaza uh, to continue. You wrote that in 2006. Clearly, there is nothing incremental about the genocide today. Given your clarity about Isra where Israel was headed back then, are you surprised by the savagery and brutality that Israel is perpetrating today? I must say that although I did expect a very brutal and ruthless uh, Israeli uh, 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 reaction to uh, the uh, operation of the Hamas on October the 7th, I did not uh, foresee them such a magnitude of inhumanity and such a level of criminality and dehumanization as Israel has uh, inflicted 
on the people of Gaza. I mean, I did anticipate a, a very ruthless and, and violent reaction, but I must say that this is beyond anything I, I, I could imagine. And I think you're absolutely right. Whereas I think the years of siege were incremental genocide in the sense of creating conditions which were uninhabitable uh, uh, for people in Gaza. This is a, a genocide that is taking place in front of our eyes on a daily basis. It's nothing incremental about it. And it's um, uh, a really a vicious, intentional attempt to uh, use the 7th of October as a pretext to deal with what Israel has been unable to deal with, uh, which is the presence of nearly 2 million Palestinians uh, in this part of historical Palestine. And they seem to think that they have now an historical opportunity and there is no moral inhibition uh, uh, in implementing the idea of removing Gaza or, uh, you know, wiping out or raising Gaza, uh, the Strip, not as a city, the Strip as a whole from the map of Palestine. Ilan, um, you have a unique perspective as an Israeli who's completely rejected Zionism, and yet Israel is the society you grew up in. Um, tell us about what you see happening inside uh, Israel 48 today. What are the political and social realities that have brought us to this point where seemingly an entire society is united around the goal of the extermination of a people they've already, for 80 years, uh, a century, subjected to dispossession, occupation, apartheid, and persecution? You know, uh, uh, in, in 1999, I wrote an article for the Journal of Palestine Studies examining the Israeli educational system, cultural system, and political system. And I argued in that article in 1999 that the next generations of Israelis who will go through the official Israeli educational system, through the socialization uh, in the army, uh, through the, the media indoctrination, would become even worse than the early Zionist settlers, uh, become a group of supremacists, racist uh, uh, a group of people uh, that uh, would uh, inflict uh, disasters not only on historical Palestine, but also in the area uh, around Palestine. I'm afraid I was totally correct in this uh, assessment. And this was based on, uh, you know, analyzing the content uh, of the textbook, the, the curricula, and, and the basic messages that young Israeli Jews were getting through the various socialization systems uh, in Israel. Uh, so what we see now, namely the fact that more than 97% of the Israelis support the genocide in Gaza is not surprising, unfortunately. Uh, it's a society that is used to dehumanize the Palestinians uh, ever since it uh, set foot in Palestine in the late 19th century, in particular, when its leaders committed the ethnic cleansing of 1948. You cannot massively kill, pe kill, kill people. You cannot uh, be totally indifferent to the death of babies, for babies operated without anesthetics, for, for, to children burying children, and for your own army committing one war crime after the other, unless you totally dehumanize the victims of these kinds of policies. And, and dehumanization doesn't come easily to people, contrary to what people think. You need to work on it. You need to socialize people. You need to indoctrinate them to such a level. But, but this is a fact now. And the fact is that, of course, there are Israeli individuals who are not like that, thank God. Uh, there are not all of them like that, but the vast majority are. And this includes uh, the, the soldiers in the Gaza Strip, the generals, the, 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 um, you know, the pundits who comment in the Israeli media about the actions, not to mention, of course, the political uh, leaders. Uh, and, and therefore, we come back to the point we already uh, made, I made before that don't expect for, to, for a change within Israel to occur in order if you are wishing, like all of us should wish, for these terrible crimes against the Palestinians to cease. If you really want to stop 
genocide, and, and let's not forget the killing of 400 people in the West Bank. Uh, if you really want to stop these policies now and those that Israel is planning in the future, the only way is a pressure from the outside. There are moments in history where you cannot rely on a rogue state to change from within, and it has to be pressured to change. And, and there are the means of doing it, as we have seen in the case of apartheid South Africa and similar cases in history. We're, we're definitely going to talk about that, but we want to take advantage of your deep knowledge and scholarship and uh, go back to some more uh, historical context. Um, some 80% of the population in Gaza are refugees from cities, towns, and villages that are now part of Israel, the 1948 areas, um, including the lands where some of the kibbutzes that were raided on the 7th of October have been built. Um, talk to us about the history of the so-called Gaza envelope of the people in Gaza and what Israel's policy towards them ha have has been. Yes, I think it's a very important point, Ali, because people may, may think that there always was a Gaza Strip. Uh, before 1948, there was no Gaza Strip. There was a town called Gaza and, 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 and small, uh, small and large villages around it. Uh, on the road, uh, the Via Maris, the main road on the, on the Mediterranean between uh, Alexandria in Egypt and Alexandretta in Turkey, it was a very pastoral place uh, and very cosmopolitical because so many people were using the road and going through Gaza. It had uh, all, all three religions were uh, uh, represented in the, in the town of Gaza, the, the Muslims, the Christians, and the Jews. And, and it was quite... A, 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 a beautiful spot in historical Palestine. When Israel uh, uh, began its ethnic cleansing, it was trying to massively move people outside the borders of what became the state of Israel. So people were moved, Palestinians were moved to the north, to Lebanon and Syria, and to the east, uh, to Jordan. However, the hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who were removed and pushed by force from the center and south of Palestine uh, were, were directed towards Egypt, but Egypt did not was unwilling to accept the Palestinian refugees. So the Israeli leaders decided to concede, in adverted commas, 2% of Palestine, although they had the power to, to, to occupy it, and create this rectangle that became the Strip as a receptor for all these hundreds of thousands of Palestinians that they have expelled from the central and south of Palestine. Now, the last wave of expulsion was exactly from those uh, villages uh, uh, on, which, on whose ruins some of the settlements that were attacked on the 7th of October were built. We have in the Israeli archive uh, a, a document from the 25th of November, 1948, called Order Number 40, which is sent from the Central Command to the commanders in the area that today would be called the area around Gaza. And it lists 11 villages, and the order is to burn them and expel the people from them to Gaza. The, these village, on the ruins of these villages, the settlements uh, were built. So what you have in Gaza is the second and the third generation of people who were not just removed forcefully from the rest of Palestine, but also people who are direct descendants of the people who were expelled from the villages on which the uh, kibbutzim and, uh, and, and development towns were built around the present uh, uh, Gaza Strip. And also, Ilan, talk about, uh, and, and by the way, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we spoke about a story I'd written with David Sheen, which focused on uh, I think it was kibbutz near Oz, which is one of several uh, kibbutzes built on the land of Al Ma'in, a Palestinian community, which was largely um, the home of uh, members of the Abu Sitta family, including uh, Salman Abu Sitta, who has written himself about what he witnessed in 1948 as a, as a child, and uh, the land of. Um, Al Ma'in and the Abu Sitte family is now uh, where several of these kibbutzes sit. 
Um, talk to us also about the city of Al Majdal, Asqalan, which is now Ashkelon, oh. because I think many people know that um, most of the Palestinians were expelled in 1948, starting in 1947, in 1948. But the expulsions did not stop after 1948, after the establishment of the of the State of Israel. Is is that correct? Absolutely uh, correct. Uh, and it was not out of a, a strategic decision because of technical issues that had to do with some problem of coordination in the Israeli army. The thousands of people who, who uh, lived in Majd al uh, were not expelled in 1948. And they were instead uh, uh, enclaved in a, a, an area which the Israeli military governors themselves called the ghetto. And, and in the ghetto, in Majel Askalan, uh, in the ghetto, most of the uh, population of Majel Askalan lived between 1948 until 1950. And while they were living in those uh, enclaves, uh, uh, the, the Israeli Jewish city of Ashkelon was built uh, around them. Uh, in 1950, uh, uh, it, it was this, the Israeli uh, army decided to, uh, or it was a rather a political decision by, by the government led by David Ben-Gurion, that this is not a very healthy situation for the new immigrants who were sent to Ashkelon, uh, many of them coming from uh, Arab countries, and there was always a worry that, uh, you know, the Arab Jews and the Palestinians might find a common uh, conversation, a common common uh, uh, basis for a dialogue and so on. So it was decided to forcefully uh, add them to the people who were already refugees in the Gaza Strip. And, and because this is 1950, and there's already new uh, re reporters, Israeli reporters and other reporters, we have quite an extensive documentation on the very process of the expulsion, namely the fact that people were shot above their heads to make sure that they leave. Uh, and uh, I, ironically, Israel was expelling thousands of people who were regarded as citizens of Israel, uh, according to the con the the independence declaration of the state of Israel, boasting equality for everyone. And uh, the only reason that they were expelled was that they were Palestinians. And and, and that is important. And, and as you rightly say, this did not only happen in Askelan, uh, in Majdal Askelan. Between 1948 and 1967, and especially in the first 10 years of Israel's statehood, dozens of Palestinian villages were emptied by force. Uh, by the Israeli army on the borders with Lebanon, uh, uh, Jordan, and Jordan, and expelled to the other side uh, of, of, of the border. Hmm. You mentioned, Ilan, that uh, many of the people that Israel moved into the former lands and homes of the Palestinians around what is now the Gaza Strip were Arab Jews. Talk about that. Why did they send Arab Jews to, to those areas? And what role did Arab Jews play in uh, the establishment of Israel? Yeah. Uh, Israel, I mean, the Zionist movement, uh, original impulse was to create a European Jewish state on the ruins of Palestine. And until 1948, the Zionist leadership showed very little interest in the Jewish communities in the Arab world. Uh, for two reasons. One, these communities did not suffer from anti-Semitism, and therefore there was no impulse in those communities compared to the communities in Central and Eastern Europe in particular to leave a place where they lived for hundreds, and in the case of Iraq, thousands of years. Uh, so that's one reason that uh, it was not easy to induce them anyway to, to come. And secondly, until 1948, they were regarded as Arabs. And therefore, there was no wish by the European uh, uh, Zionist leadership to de to Arabize the, the Zionist project, so to speak. However, after the Holocaust and the loss of six million Jews in Europe, and the fact that a lot of Jewish survivors from the Holocaust did not choose Israel as their destiny uh, destination, I'm sorry, and and prefer to go to the to England, the United States, or even go back to some of the European countries from which they originally came. Uh, there was a demographic need 
or Israel wanted a demographic injunction uh, uh, to increase the number of Jews uh, in Israel. And there, uh, in after 1948, Israel began a massive campaign to try and persuade uh, the Jews from Arab countries to come to Israel. Um, uh, they they uh, use all kinds of methods, uh, different ones. I, we don't have time, and maybe one day we can have a more a deeper conversation about it. But I will just give two examples to show how how different communities had to be approached differently by Israel. Uh, in Yemen, where the the community was far more religious, they they spread the ideas and and lied to the Jews of Yemen that Israel is a very theocratic religious place where. You know, Jews can practice Judaism, which, of course, was not the case in 1948. And in Iraq, they planted bombs in Iraqi synagogues in order to persuade the Jews to come uh, uh, to Israel. However, after they all came, about one million of them, uh, they were still regarded by the Zionist leadership as Arabs. So they had to be de-Arabized. And there were several methods that were used to de-Arabize them. Uh, one was to locate them on the geographical uh, uh, margins of the state near the boundaries with the Arab states where it was very clear that these were very active borders in terms of frictions and, and clashes and, and that would the hope was that it would increase their animosity towards the Arabs uh, in general uh, a, another uh, a way of doing it was to force them to change their names to be, uh, to, to be totally alien to their roots and language uh, and so on Unfortunately, even without that indoctrination, many, and especially this is particularly true about the North African Jews, they, un they felt that the best way to be initiated or to be accepted as equals in the Israeli-European Jewish society was to show animosity and hatred towards the Arabs in general and towards the Palestinians in particular. And that is why the right-wing parties in Israel, the more fascist parties, and the more extreme ones uh, can rely on, especially North African Jews, to provide with them the electoral force uh, in national elections. So uh, they were used, they are victims, as uh, Ella Shochat rightly says, they're also victims of Zionism. However, as can happen in societies, they, uh, instead of directing their anger and their outrage towards the people who really victimized them, they thought that it's easier to direct it towards the Palestinians who had nothing to do with their suffering, with their uproot, uh, uprootness, and, and a lack of equality within the Israeli Jewish society. Ilan, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the kind of strategic uh, location of these kibbutzim in uh, the so-called Gaza envelope area and how the Israeli state has used these uh, colonial settlements um, as kind of, you know, ramparts for, um, uh, you know, military uh, surveillance of the Gaza Strip. Can you talk a little bit about the, the, the strategy of, uh, of Israeli policy of of placing these, uh, you know, these uh, seemingly innocuous, you know, farmland, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, they were they were branded as like a socialist utopia. These these kibbutzes, um, but what what uh, intention was there in in building them um, so close to what's now the Gaza Strip? Well, this is typical of settler colonial uh, movements. Uh, uh, the 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 the, uh, the settler colonial project is, is is a structure; it never stops, and it has to occupy a land that belongs to indigenous people and occupy it again and again because there's always a a risk that the indigenous people would not sit peacefully when they are dispossessed from their the land. So what happens is that you totally militarize the civil space. So um, uh, you, uh, uh, any settlement, especially on the borderline between areas that have already been colonized and areas that haven't been yet colonized, those who sit on the border, uh, on the one hand, they are civilians and they lead civic life. But on the other hand, they're also soldiers, they're also military. They, uh, uh, and therefore they, they carry guns and, and they are functioning as, as the outposts 
uh, in a military sense uh, towards the, the so-called uh, enemy. So I, I think that they play a very important role in the colonization. Uh, first of all, historically, they played a very important role in the colonization. Uh, uh, and of course, they play a contemporary role in uh, uh, policing the millions of Palestinians. Uh, in between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean, Mediterranean there are millions of Palestinians. A and Israel polices them in different ways. It uses the Jewish settlements in the West Bank in a similar way uh, uh, to be part of the policing of the oppressive uh, 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 metrics of power uh, alongside military bases, alongside the secret a service uh, operation, and unfortunately, also with collaboration with the Palestinian Authority in, in, in some places. And uh, inside Israel, they're using the, 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 the Jewish settlements in the Galilee and in the Nakab in a very similar way. So, in, and, and they used, they tried to do it in Gaza as well until 2005, but because Gaza doesn't mean much biblically, they couldn't get a large number of Jews to settle in Gaza itself. And that's when Sharon said it's much better to take them out and create this huge prison uh, called Gaza and attack it from the outside without worrying uh, of the fate of the settlers in the inside. In, in, if you think about it, the Hamas in many ways enabled us to go back to that situation where uh, uh, this pharmaceutical Israeli idea that Gaza can be totally disassociated from the Isra from Israel and only be attacked without any uh, danger uh, uh, to Israel the Hamas always challenged that first with the Hamas and uh, with the uh, um, with the rockets uh, and, and now with this particular uh, operation so, so I think yes it's 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 a kind of of a reality where uh, you know, probably best described as Israel being an army with a state rather than a state with an army. Um, Ilan, we could talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the history and the context is so important to understanding the present day because, um, you know, Israel and its supporters want us to believe history started on October 7th. And that's always, you know, history starts from whatever moment is most suitable uh, to those powerful uh, and to the oppressors. <clears throat> but you were so prescient uh, all those years ago when you wrote about genocide in Gaza, and it wasn't a word that anyone used lightly about Israel's actions. It uh, was almost unimaginable at that time to think that the International Court of Justice could be considering a case very seriously as to whether Israel is perpetrating genocide. And they've already found that uh, it is a plausible case and ordered Israel to stop all genocidal acts, which, of course, Israel hasn't done. I want to ask you, thinking about the situation in Israel, where do you see things heading? What will it take to stop this genocide? What can pierce this uh, fanaticism of, of this Israeli population? Uh, you alluded to that earlier, but I want you to explore that uh, more. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I'm afraid that uh, we, we have to, uh, as painful as it is, uh, distinguish between the very near future and the more distant future. I'm afraid that uh, in the near future, although it seems that Israel is acting in such a way that we begin to see actions like the Canadian government's decision to stop arm or to spend uh, arms supplies to Israel and so on, that uh, you know, in terms of the BDS movement, we are beginning to see the S, the sanctions, and not just the boycott and divestment, but as we can notice, first of all, it's incremental, it's piecemeal, uh, and uh, we, we don't even know whether it's really happening. Not that I'm underestimating the symbolic uh, uh, force of that. Uh, uh, so I think it might have an accumulative uh, 
uh, uh, impact on Israel, but knowing the Israeli society, uh, it would have to be far more severe, far more direct, far more transparent that this is really happening. Uh, and it has to do with uh, the treatment of Israeli uh, sports teams in the world, uh, music, uh, uh, arms sales, and, and so on. And, you know, wh whereas maybe the global south would move a bit quicker, I think, towards that kind of action, I'm afraid that the global north would take far more time, not to mention the United States, and God knows what the American elections would mean for that kind of action. So I, I'm afraid if I'm very honest, in my, if, if I'm cru uh, bitterly honest, uh, I, I'm, I, I cannot see a, a, an effective international action within a year or a year and a half. I can see it later on. I can see it later on. I, but by the way, I don't want to, to sound as if I would raise my hands and say, there's nothing we can do because of that. No, I, I'm just saying that if uh, we cannot be observers, and, and think that this is a, a, a dynamics that happened by themselves. It means every every one of us who is involved in this should double and triple their efforts, and and not kind of take for granted that you know the ICJ and later the ICC or other organization are strong enough at this moment in time to to force Israel. There's also another problem with Israel. It can seem to accept certain things, and then it does them incrementally. It does them, uh, uh, you know, in in a different way. But from the Palestinians' victims' point of view, it's the same kind of thing. So I don't have. I wish I had a, a successful formula for the next year or so. Uh, I, I I I see that the resistance continues. I think that we should pay attention to a possible more severe resistance in the West Bank. We don't yet know what will happen in the north of Israel or Palestine. But I think we have to take into account that you do not stop such a criminal act in one act in one day. Uh, it's, and, and it's terrible to say it because I know what it means on a daily basis. But I want to be brutally realistic here and not... Uh, you know, not not promise something that isn't. But if I may, I do really believe, and and this I say as a scholar, not just as an activist. I really, see, and I said it before, and I'm going to say it again in, in every stage. I, as a scholar, I can see clear indications that the Zionist project is entering its last phase. It's the beginning of the end of this project. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable from. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, from looking at it from the inside, the Jewish society, it's imploding from the inside. There is no cement that holds the various groups in Israel together. Uh, it's not sustainable because I think young Jews all over the world would stop equating Zionism with Judaism. It's not sustainable because the Palestinian younger generation have a much better vision and ideas of how to push forward the liberation struggle. And it's not sus uh, uh, sustainable because of Israel's economic problems and, and the possibilities of changes in the region and definitely in the way the international community treats Israel as a pariah state. However, these processes will take more time, uh, uh, but they will happen. So there is a kind of a dawn after this dark night, but I would be irresponsible if I would say that I know exactly how to, to end this night, terrible uh, uh, period today. But I do want to beseech anyone who's listening to us. Um, it's working in a sense that you cannot see the full picture, but it works if, if, if it's relentless, if it doesn't stop, uh, if, if uh, uh, everything we are doing is, is done 24-7 as much as, as we can, because I do think the more accumulative the impact is, the shorter the period uh, in which uh, Israel finally would be uh, hold to be accountable and maybe begin to pay the price that apartheid South Africa paid during the beginning of the sanctions when they started. Uh, the civil society actions of boycott and divestment are very important. Uh, but I think that we need to find a way of moving, as I said, between the B and D to the S. I think that's a very crucial uh, idea. And if I may, may add to this, of course, we're still looking 
desperately at the Arab world and the Muslim world to do much, much more. Uh, and they can. They really can do much more uh, than they have done so far uh, without going into the domestic issues of their, of their politics. Uh, even with the current regimes that are there, I don't think they have exhausted their possibilities of lending an effective hand to, to the overall efforts in the world to stop the genocide uh, uh, as soon as possible. So, Ilan, you, you said that um, Israel is imploding in a way. The Zionist project is imploding. What does that mean? Do you, do you think we can look forward 10, 20 years and say that Israel would still be there or Israel might be gone? I mean, at what, you know, I know that nobody can put a date on it, but where does this process of implosion lead in, in your view? I think what 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 we can uh, see quite clearly is a takeover of uh, Israel by the more theocratic, more extreme uh, group of Israelis, whom I called in one of my last pieces uh, the state of Judea, the state of the settlers. It takes over the state of Israel. Uh, I mean, both the state of Israel, which is the more liberal Zionist side, and the uh, theocratic messianic uh, Jewish side, the state of Judea, both of them, of course, uh, uh, believe in the apartheid system uh, and occupation and colonization of Palestine, but they have different view of what the Israeli Jewish society should look from the inside. And I think all those Israelis who still think that they can uphold apartheid alongside a multicultural society, an open society, a liberal society, are losing uh, very quickly their political power. They already are absent from the higher echelons of the secret service, of the Mossad, of the army, of the political important political junctures where policies are, are, are taking place. Now, this kind of Israel, the Judea Israel, if you want, uh, would be find it even more and more difficult. They don't even believe it's important to have international legitimacy, but they would find it more and more difficult to get this legitimacy, which means a lot of other people would leave, would not want to stay, uh, regardless of the situation with the Palestinians. It's just not the kind of place they want. And if they have the money, if they have the passports, if they have the, the profession that can relocate them and their capitals outside, they will do it. So I can, I can see a drain of a certain group of Israelis who are the elite uh, and who pay 80% of the Israeli taxes outside uh, of Israel. And, and, and so I think it's, it's, it's a process of collapse that I cannot exactly predict how it would look at the end of the collapse, but I can definitely point to the cracks in the building, if you want, and they're getting wider uh, and wider. The one thing I would just like to add is that when such a structure collapses or even weakens to, uh, to such a level, it creates a void. And if the Palestinian national movement is not there to fill the void, this is a chaos that can continue. So it's not always uh, an, an assured formula for building something new unless there is, you know, uh, a preparedness for that kind of uh, uh, historical reality unfolding. Uh, but I, I do believe that this is not it's not sustainable. It's not working anymore. Just do you, I can, do you see? Yeah. Just no. to ask you, do you see in terms of? I, I assume you you closely observe the Israeli press and media, and of course you you have uh, still connections to a country you were yeah. you were born in. Do you see Israelis talking about this among themselves? Do, is this this you know? It, it's a common thing for people to say, oh. You know, a lot of Israelis have second passports, which is true. A lot don't, particularly the uh, Arab Jews or the, the Jews from Arab countries uh, are the least likely to have uh, second passports, yeah, right. probably. But Jews who have connections to Mo North America, Canada, Europe, and so on do. So do they talk about this? Is it already happening? Is this, this departure already uh happening what what can you tell us from your close observations of um discussions within israeli society yeah 
First of all, I, I should say that up to the 7th of October, there was already clear indications of people relocating themselves and their capital outside of Israel. Not in huge number, but in significant numbers in terms of the quality of the capital that they had and the position that they had in, in the Israeli economic elite. So this is a process that began before the 7th of October. In a way, the 7th of October stopped for a while in the name of, you know, a kind of instinctive unity uh, uh, in reaction to the 7th of October, but it is resuming. So it is happening. I think that there are two kinds of uh, conversations in Israel uh, uh, that are taking place. There's one, but both conversations have something in common. And the common thing is that it's clear that the next 50 years, the only promise in the horizon that Israeli politicians and leaders have for Israelis is continued bloodshed and wars. This is very clear. And you hear it also from Israelis who support the war and probably don't have the passport to go out. They, they understand that Israel in the next 50 years is a state that at best defeats, if you want, its enemies, but is all the time constantly a militarized zone. Even if, you know, in a successful scenario, that, that you, you, you manage that. Uh, the second, con that's, that's one conversation. What can we do? This is our life. Some of them would buy into Netanyahu's uh, uh, idea that this is a lot of Jews because of anti-Semitism and there's nothing you can do. I think there is another conversation which says, is it really the only way to live? Uh, again, I, I, I would have loved to say that this has anything to do with compassion towards the Palestinians, realization of the criminality towards the Palestinians. It is not, not yet. Who knows? Maybe this will come as well. But for the time being, it's just a, a realistic uh, a view at a situation where, especially after the 7th of October, you say to yourself, so this is my life now. Uh, so if, I'm, if I love military life, if I love... If, and some people do, and I love wars, and I love, you know, if, if I like that kind of, of existence, that yes, maybe I'm in the right place, you know, like Sparta in, in, in ancient times. But if, if at all there is a modicum of uh, 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 desire in me to have what one should call maybe normal life, this is not the place to be in. Again, I, I even detach it from the Palestinians. It's, it's almost like saying, I am, I've built the state to be a safe haven for Jews all over the world. And it is the most dangerous place for Jews to be in right now. And that's a contradiction you don't easily gloss over. Yeah. Uh, and the numbers are very clear. So this is not something you fabricate. You can easily, they know it. They know it. It's not very safe to be an Israeli Jew. It's the only place where it's not really safe. They are exaggerating anti-Semitism elsewhere. Jews are not killed, are not being attacked, in, 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 apart from very small individual numbers, uh, if, 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 because they are part of an alien, oppressive colonialist presence in the midst of the Arab world. They have created insecurity for them, which unfortunately also radiates and projects on some Jewish communities in the world as well. And yet the Biden and well, Biden himself has said that there is no safe place but Israel for Jews all over the world. I mean, it's, it's well, Biden has said cities. so many things. <laughs> <laughs> he said he's yeah. a Zionist president. Right. Uh, like we yeah. can tell him that the World Zionist Congress is looking for a new president. Um, um, right in. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, what, what American politicians have said since the 7th of October, especially Secretary of State and the president. Really, I mean, this is beyond uh, beyond anything we, we're used to. You know, I just finished a book which will come out in the end of the month called Lobbying for Zionism on Two Sides yeah. of the Atlantic, uh, uh, examining the history of lobbying for Zionism, both in Britain and the United States. And there were such moments of pathetic expressions by American leaders, but I think nothing comes close to yeah. uh, what we've heard uh, from American leadership since the 7th of October, especially in the first two months. I I wanted to quickly ask you about, I mean, you know, you were talking about um, uh, Israelis leaving and, and, and you know, escaping uh, 
you know, what they don't, what, what you know, th this fantasy that was never um, realized, obviously, as as a settler colony. Um, but what are, what are what do you think are the prospects of the settlers, um, you know, who have been evacuated from the kibbutzes around Gaza and and also in the north of historic Palestine? Do you think they'll ever go back? Do, like, where do you think the the maps will be redrawn once once this is once this is over? Yeah, it's very difficult to say. I mean, some of the people in the envelope uh, area. Uh, are coming from development towns. Uh, so, so they don't have that many options to live elsewhere. So I think they will return. Uh, the members of the kibbutzim, I think some of them will not. The north is a big question. Uh, uh, as far as they're concerned, unless Israel occupies south of Lebanon, they're not going back. So the Israeli government is really a huge challenge there. It just adds to the other challenges. But you have to remember that the main problem is not so much how the map would look like. I think there's a much more fundamental problem for Israel. The government is not functioning. There's no government. It doesn't function. The only uh, 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 services people, the only effective service Israeli Jews receive are from the civil society. I mean, it is a civil society that is you know, experience in situations of war and emergencies, and therefore it, it reacts and was able to provide, uh, uh, you know, uh, food, uh, housing, and so on, which the government should have done. Uh, but the government is not functioning. It's, it's, uh, uh, it has a lot to do with the personality of the prime minister, but not only, but not only. Uh, um, so I think that uh, uh, no less important is not only the question whether they will return or not, whether Israel would return to what it used to be at least, an effective state, at least as far as its Jewish citizens were concerned. We are now nearly half a year since the 7th of October, and there's no indication for it. Uh, and we know how Israeli uh, electoral uh, system works with the coalition government and so on. So, so even if there is a group of politicians, let's say, that are a bit more competent and would enable to reignite or reactivate the, the state uh, systems and ministries, they would rely in a coalition of people who are either messianic uh, or, or are totally uh, incompetent. Uh, and therefore, it, it all adds to this picture, which uh, I, I think that quite a few Israeli Jews uh, would agree with me, not many, but more than ever before, that this is not working. This is not working. I mean, I would like to explain to them that it's not working because originally you cannot impose yourself on a different country and take it over and, and be an alien in an area. But they, they haven't reached that level of analysis. But, but they're just looking at the reality and it's not working and they can't see where the alternative for it will come. Um, the total reliance on the United States is suddenly hit, and, hit them in the face. I mean, the biggest worry in Israel is now is from every time Netanyahu opens his mouth criticizing Biden, many Israelis fear uh, that he doesn't realize that without the United States, militarily and economically, Israel is not sustainable. Uh, I, I don't think we ever were in that situation. Uh, and uh, uh, if we, if history uh, uh, teaches us anything, uh, uh, these kinds of processes begin very slow, but then they accumulate speed, and 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 then they become very dramatic and monumental, as happened in the Soviet Union, uh, in South Africa, and other places of South Vietnam around the world. It's really a very far cry, Ilan, from the image of Israel that. I remember growing up with in the 1980s, which was even if we saw Israel as um, as a usurper state, as a, as a, an aggressor, as an occupier, um, there was a certain sense that Israel was uh, strong, competent. Um, that even if it had a lot of support from the United States, that it was a very capable. Um, and uh, that uh, 
you know that that uh, Israel could do anything, um, and uh, it's remarkable how totally that has unraveled, and Israel looks as dysfunctional as uh, any state in the region that you could point to, or any state in the world for that matter, and the image of the um, brave, courageous, courageous, capable Israeli soldier has uh, has completely collapsed uh, into these, uh, not to say the brutality wasn't there, of course it was, as your own work has, has documented the massacres and the brutality from the very beginning, but nonetheless there was this idea of the... Um, Capable and brave Israeli soldier, you know the the raid at Entebbe, the 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 heroism and so on, the Mossad, the long arm of the Mossad, which could reach anyone anywhere in the world at any time. Now they look like thuggish, brutal clowns, and they don't scare anyone. They 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 horrify and disgust, but they don't inspire awe and uh, fear in the way that uh, that they did. Do Israelis have a sense of this change? Do they understand, do they see this change in their image and, and understand it? It's interesting. I think it's kind of a mixed picture. On the one hand, they say to themselves, and I read it in many and talked with people there, uh, saying, imagine what would have happened if Hezbollah would have coordinated with Hamas a joint attack on Israel on the 7th of October how would Israel would have fared. And we're still talking about two guerrilla armies, not two conventional uh, armies, you know, armies without aeroplanes, tanks, and, and proper artillery. And and um, so, so on the one hand, there is this idea that uh, Israel is not invincible, that it doesn't function. On the other hand, they're trying to create a new story of heroism, uh, uh, under the fog that we all don't know exactly what happened on the 7th of October. So they begin to build these stories of heroism on the day itself, and of course, heroism uh, in Gaza, and so on. So they're trying to rebuild this image of uh, uh, a, a heroic, uh, uh, a competent army. I don't think it, it sticks. I don't think it holds water. So I think they are aware of it. Um, again, it's it's the kind of uh, thing that you have to remember that it's uh, this reality is being faced by people who generation after generation were indoctrinated in a certain way. Uh, it becomes kind of part of their DNA, if you want, or, or mentality, as they call it in Arabic, aklia, it, it, that um, anything like this uh, is uh, due to anti-Semitism, due to the fact that everybody hates us, nothing to do with what we're doing and so on. It may still work with some Israeli Jews, this idea that, you know, uh, this is um, a terrible period. Uh, we have nothing to do with it. It's done to us because that's the lot of Jews uh, throughout history. I think that some of them begin to doubt whether this is effective. I remember people were totally surprised when I talked uh, to audiences, I remember in Australia and other places, they really don't believe it, but recently the BBC even admitted this, is most of the Israelis consume news only from the Israeli media. They really have not seen one, you have to remember that, they have not seen one picture from Gaza that tells you about the suffering of the people of Gaza. Not one picture in the last six months. And they, I know that they can have access to other uh, uh, alternative uh, uh, media, or even, even, you know, even the mainstream media in the West is enough to give you some indication. But they, they, don't, they don't know and they don't want to know, and even if they know the dehumanization in such a level that it doesn't. So it's, it's a complex situation where um, one of the things we should... I'm, and I think it's up to us, the anti-Zionist uh, uh, Jews who were born in Israel, to work on this. Um, and, and this should not trouble the Palestinians. It's not the Palestinian problem. But I think it's up to us to tell them that there is an alternative. That there is an alternative. It's very difficult because 
they are so brutal now, and but, but there are still millions of people, and not all of them were born, you know, criminals and heartless and so on. Uh, 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 th th there is an alternative, um, and, and you know, you you've written about the one state solution. I've written about the one state solution. We we did not imagine a, a, a human rights state. We didn't say that these states would have no Jews in them. We just talked about a state of a liberated, decolonized, and uh, mm. based on equality. Um, because, you know, I'm part of the one state democratic initiative in Israel, and the initial reaction was, let's not talk about it now. You know, it's not the time. I'm not sure about it anymore. At first, I agreed because, you know, we all wanted to focus on how to stop the genocide. I still think that talking about a horizon, uh, which is different from the one we're seeing here, is something that is worth talking about. But um, as we said at the beginning of the conversation, uh, uh, the process of deprogramming uh, Israeli Jews or waiting for them to wake up or understand maybe with the distance of time and so on, is not a precondition for the liberation of Palestine. It's Ilan, not a precondition. Yeah. Ilan, that's something I would love to, to hear about uh, in the future as you make those points. We'd love for you to come back and talk about the reactions. It's so fascinating for us. One thing I'll say, when you talked about how Israelis only see Israeli media, Another phenomenon I've noticed is it seems they think nobody else sees Israeli media, that uh, right. that that what they say in Hebrew is like a private conversation only among Israelis. And that's why it's such a rich source for us. A lot of the reporting we do is simply translating what comes from Israeli media because Absolutely. they're so much more honest with each other uh mm -hmm. that that uh you know they think no one else that that hebrew is a secret language no one else can can decipher yeah. so it's a terribly useful uh source for us just um we just have a couple of minutes uh, i i have one question for you and and i think nora has one um maybe uh, since i'm speaking I'll, I'll go first um ilan you were born in Haifa in Palestine to uh, German Jewish parents, if I'm correct. That's what right. Would, what would you say now? What do you say now to the German people and the leaders of Germany? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, this is a very important topic uh, for me. Uh, in one sentence, almost like a soundbite, but I will explain it in two more sentences after that. I would say that Germany was once on the wrong side of history, and I don't know why it insists to be once more on the wrong side of history. And what I mean by this, of course you understand what I mean by this, but I would just, just to make sure that everybody understands what I'm talking about it, I think that um, the fact that the Germans think that they absolve themselves from what uh, has been done uh, by the Nazi Germans in the Second World War by uh, supporting unconditionally and without any inhibitions the colonization of palestine and the present genocide they are abusing the holocaust memory they are not uh, uh, um, uh, compensating for what they have done but rather they are leaving it uh, as an open wound rather than allow it to be healed uh, uh, and the second point i i would say that I'm really surprised. I speak German. So as, as you say that Hebrew is not a secret language, German is not a secret language to me. And I cannot understand how intelligent people, educated people, coming from a society that has a lot to contribute and had contributed to civilization, how these intellectuals and educated people uh, appear to be so stupid and, uh, uh, and and superficial in the way that they express themselves when it comes to the question of Israel and Palestine in general, and especially uh, to the situation that unfolds in front of our eyes now. It's, it's quite painful to see people parroting the Israeli uh, narrative. Uh, uh, either they know that they are doing it on purpose because they think it serves Germany or whatever, or 
they are really totally blinded and, and ignorant uh, because of the way uh, the German intellectual elite developed vis-à-vis uh, -vis the question uh, of Palestine. But we should say, uh, large sections of the young German society in the civil society, and we should remember it, demonstrate in the thousands every week for Palestine. Young students and young faculty members uh, really uh, courageously courageously uh, face a, a German academic establishment that threatens to throw them out uh, uh, and, and, and uh, suspend them, and nonetheless they continue uh, to do this. We have to remember uh, that Germany has one of the largest Palestinian community in, in, in the West. So, so I, I would not lose hope uh, for the, the, the German society, but the present uh, as political establishment, cultural and intellectual establishment, is really, uh, it's a shameful uh, chapter uh, in, in, in Germany, Germany's history uh, that is meant to compensate for, for, for another shameful uh, chapter, uh, but is doing exactly uh, the opposite. We just have uh, literally a minute left, uh, Ilan, but finally, um, what gives you hope? these days in these very dark um, yeah. and, and uh, relentless times? Well, I must, you know, I, I, I have a center for Palestine studies in the University of Exeter, which has uh, about 40 uh, Palestinian postgraduates or people working on Palestine. And through them, I'm, I can see the networking to other young Palestinians and pro-Palestinians around the world, especially the young people. They give me a lot of hope. They have a clear vision for the future. They have a huge amount of energy and levels of, of commitment. And I think that they have the power uh, uh, to lead us into a different uh, future. Uh, and with the uh, kind of processes I described before in our conversation, I really think that in the medium uh, run, not the long run even, uh, we will see the beginning of a different kind of reality. The, our greatest fear is for the next year, two years, and three years. But if we can somehow survive it and, and do what we can to, to tame it, uh, I think we are into a much better uh, 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 chapter in the history of modern uh, Palestine. Dr. Yulan Pape, uh, you are a legendary historian, writer, activist, scholar, uh, and friend, and contributor to the Electronic Intifada. We are um, very, very grateful for all the work that you have done over the decades and continue to do. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank, thank you, you so much. So, thank you, Ali. Hope to have you again Laura. soon. Yeah. Thank you. Inshallah, of course. Absolutely. I would love to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Incredible. Um, thank you, Ali, for coordinating that interview. It's just, uh, he's, yeah. I, I mean, Ilan is someone who, as I said, I consider a friend and I've known for many, many years. And he was so far ahead of many people on a lot of issues in terms of understanding and explaining what Israel is and what it would become. And, uh, and he's, as he said to us, he, he's giving us brutal honesty when he says he doesn't think things are going to improve in the short term. But the fact that somebody who, ha who is so rooted in the reality and the utter horror of what we're seeing still has hope uh, for the future is is something that uh, is important, something to hold yeah. close. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.